Your Excellency, in 2017, you became the world's first AI minister. So in these five years, what has been your greatest learning? Well, thank you, uh, Mina, and uh, congratulations on 15 years as an institution. Uh, walking in here, I actually realized that your name is an oxymoron. Um, it says the national, but it's such an international institution with international reach and connectivity. So um, it, it was a realization that I was sitting down and thinking of. Um, 2017 was a life-changing year for me. Um, as you all know, um, the UAE first actually announced its artificial intelligence strategy. And I was on my honeymoon. Um, uh, it was, I think, the first day of my honeymoon. And I remember uh, reading the announcement and telling my wife, oh, we just announced the artificial intelligence strategy. And she said, don't pay attention to these things. You know, focus on your honeymoon. And I, I remember telling her, God help whoever is going to work on this mandate. <laughs> the, the next day, I was called and, and informed that I needed to fly back uh, because I was going to be appointed as minister. And the, the first thing that struck me was, and this was initially, let's say, in 2017, that this is such a profound technology that no one understands. So whoever is going to work on it would have to overcome so many challenges without him or her being able to communicate well with the public, because the public just knows the Terminator scenario on robots and destruction, right, the apocalypse. Today, the conversation is different. Chat GPT is in most people's phones and on their computers, and, you know, it was a very quick proliferation, right? Overnight, suddenly, everyone started becoming AI experts, everyone started having a stance when it comes to this technology. Over the last five years, our role was first and foremost ensuring that we're able to improve awareness across the country. And honestly, I think we are blessed in this country that we have role models as leadership. So when their highnesses, highness the president, his highness the prime minister, announce something or say something, people take it seriously. And people actually go and educate themselves, people actually pay attention to it. As opposed to certain countries where it's seen as more of, you know, let's say, a, a opinion that people don't take seriously. Um, we've done a lot. I think there's a lot more to do. So we've uh, launched programs. I think the first year was about eradicating ignorance within the public sector, ensuring that every minister, every official in the government has someone to lean on when it comes to taking decisions uh, about artificial intelligence, ensuring that there's no black box scenario. So we launched a program with the University of Oxford to train, we have now around 320 senior leaders in the government that are AI experts, that all ministers and DGs can actually lean on. We launched AI camps across the country, uh, from Abu Dhabi to Fujairah, that got children, university students, and employees exposed to artificial intelligence. And we did a lot of programs on putting the guardrails and the ethical frameworks for AI in the country. I want to ask you about ethics and guardrails, but before we do, I want to ask you if you feel somewhat vindicated, because you have to admit there was some skepticism, cynicism, do we need a minister who's focusing on AI, is this a gimmick, will this go away? Do you feel vindicated? Actually, I remember one of my first meetings, I was meeting with a minister from a you know, well-known country, I'm not going to mention the country for the sake of the argument, and the minister was, was you know, elderly you know, compared to me at the point of time. And, and I remember in the meeting, I was talking about why we have an AI minister and, and what we're doing. And he looked at me at the end of the meeting and he said, I'm glad that a person the age of my son is talking to me about something that's a hypothetical. <laughs> and, and I smiled. I told him, Your Excellency, thank you for your feedback. And, and you know, I, I will mature and I will grow. So that part I think we can overcome. But I think AI is going to be quite serious. I said, no, 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 we have some more important issues like unemployment. And we had a 10-minute exchange about how AI is going to exacerbate unemployment and actually cause more problems. And he wasn't convinced. Uh, one of the things that makes me feel vindicated, I am sure that he is sitting at home today looking at you know, the discussions people are having about chat GPT and autonomous driving and all these things. And he's saying, you know, this kid that gave me that lecture <laughs> in 2017 was right. I, I actually believe that today the conversations are very different. And what I actually appreciate is the fact that people know a lot. 
I walk down the street and there are people who talk to me about artificial intelligence as if they're experts. And this shows me that the future is going to be positive and it shows me that my job is going to be easier rather than speaking to them about something that they don't understand or don't acknowledge. But they also say you fear what you don't know. And many around the world are, are concerned about the idea of AI, especially this technological singularity. So that moment, will we get to that tipping point when the technology, the AI, is actually overpowers us by intelligence and thought and ability to act independently. Should we fear that? But also to your point of guardrail, guardrails, what guardrails can we have? So uh, the, the first quick part of uh, this answer is ignorance breeds fear. Uh, the less you know about it, the more you're going to fear it. And I would say for all of us, it is a duty right now to actually learn more about this technology because it is a fundamental technology. It is one of the cornerstones of the future of humanity as a whole and, and every society that's going to be part of that future. The second thing is uh, our imaginations tend to go in one direction. Our imaginations are very linear. Uh, and what I mean by that, if you look at every single uh, forecast of the future in 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980, they all envisioned flying cars and flying cars by 1990, right? so, so not even in 2020. And they all env envisioned things like teleportation and space travel, and none of that was actually realized. And you have to ask yourself, why wasn't it realized? And the answer is that progress is not linear. Progress tends to be, um, you know, it, it is exponential, I think, our progress as a species but it tends to move at different paces across different eras. I think um, what is going to happen um, is the singularity is a bit far, in my humble opinion. I know that a lot of experts are weighing in and saying that it's closer than it was before. I think it is still possible that we're going to reach singularity, but there are a lot of questions that we're not answering right now. So uh, the ethical debate is going to be one that actually slows down things like the singularity, things like our push to, to AGI. And I also think that um, as we develop, there are problems that are going to weigh in on development, right? So God forbid, if there is a war, I think all of the progress we're seeing is going to come to a, to a halt and we're going to progress other aspects of our lives. If climate change does prove to be detrimental and if climate change does cause natural destruction and there are expectations that it will, I think then we're going to, as a species, start to prioritize. Do we actually want to move in this direction or focus on climate tech? And that is a question that is going to be up and coming now soon, I think. So if we assume that we're going to be in the same circumstance, if we assume that the progress is going to be linear, then we are going to achieve singularity. In my opinion, I think there are going to be a lot of variables that are going to influence de de development. I also think that what is going to happen is this technology is going to move from being front and center to being pervasive, to being uh, incognito in our lives. So what I think is going to happen is AI is going to be everywhere without you actually feeling it. This has happened in the early 2010s, so in the last decade, where AI was answering your questions, AI was telling you where to go from point A to point B, AI was suggesting what you should buy, AI was giving you the content that you are seeing, and you actually did not know that it's AI. At that point of time, it was Facebook and Google and Amazon and all of that. And today, the, the conversation has gone back to, oh, it's artificial intelligence, and there's this new thing coming up. It's been coming up for the last 50 years. I actually think we're going to go back to it being pervasive again, where it is going to teach your kids, it is going to answer your questions, it is going to do most of your work and increase your productivity, and it's going to be tools as names rather than it being artificial intelligence. So you mentioned, of course, some of the big tech companies, be it Amazon, Facebook, Meta, Google, and so forth. And part of those questions are that the development is largely by private companies and governments often are playing catch up. We, we saw the session um, in the Congress this week where there was a conversation about AI and chat GPT and there was that disconnect between those asking the questions and those necessarily um, in the know or answering them. But there's the wider point that you can't delineate. There is that connection between what governments do, what private sector does, what technology is um, developed. So how do you ensure that there is the right regulation and oversight? And I know this is a question that's often asked, but I don't think we've come to an answer. 
So uh, I'm going to be a bit political in my answer, if you'll excuse me. Um, and let me first tell you what we cannot afford to happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think historically we've always been reactive. I've been seeing this since 2017. We've always been reactive. Humanity has developed technologies. All these technologies were actually developed by the private sector, most of the times with government funding, but at times without government funding. So whether it's the airplane, whether it's the nuclear bomb or nuclear energy, uh, if you look at it, or other things. What ends up happening is there is a moment that I would call the show of force moment, where you actually see something that happens that you did not expect happening. So. In, in World War II, the nuclear bomb dropping, and you're actually seeing the devastation and the force of this tool that humanity invented. With the airplanes, it being the wild, wild west, people getting on the airplanes flying without really having any regulation until an airplane crashed into the Empire State Building in the 1920s. And then people started to say, okay, we need to have God raise on regulations. We need to actually first uh, upgrade the infrastructure and second, actually put the, the regulation for the airplanes because we don't want these flying devices to come and crash into our buildings, right? It was a foggy night, if I'm not mistaken, and the pilot did not really notice that there's a building in front of him. Um, and many other technologies developed with that kind of rhythm. So development happening on its own without any oversight from government, maybe some probing, but not really oversight. A show of force where we're actually seeing this technology and what it can do in a negative uh, construct, and then governments jumping in and trying to react. With artificial intelligence, I don't think we can afford to do that. And uh, all of the efforts that we're seeing right now are on that front. Why can't we afford to do that? Is because I think AI has already done a lot of damage in societies. So if you look at social media, the echo chambers that were created because these tools are um, incentivized to make us addicted to them, to make us look at content that might not be positive, but content that will keep us on the platform, to get us to spend. Sometimes you can't afford to buy that product, but you know, social media and these platforms actually push you to take that decision forcefully, but indirectly. So I would say we cannot afford to be reactive, but the way that we're currently moving is we are going to be reactive. The challenge that we have, and, and this is a challenge I'm facing in the UAE, is even if we were the most progressive, the most proactive country on earth, and put the best guardrails, and feel like we're safeguarded, if this goes off uh, on the wrong tangent in China, or in the US, or in the UK, or anywhere else on the, in the world, because of our interconnected digital space, it's going to harm our people here as well. So the way we have to be proactive here is that the world needs to come together and have a global conversation about this. And then bring the private sector as part of the conversation. It can't be just governments talking about this. And it can't be just the Congress in the US talking to Sam Altman or talking to Sundar Pichai or, or whoever else. It actually should be the world talking to this individual. And, and I'll give you an example. So if a country starts to enrich uranium to weapons grade, whether they disclose or not, the world knows. There are certain parameters, certain systems, certain mechanisms that allow us all to know, okay, we are concerned that this country is moving towards weapons-grade uranium. We need to have the same level of rigor, the same level of oversight on AI. That if it is going in the wrong direction somewhere, we are at least informed and aware. And to require a global coalition to do that. Is that possible? Look, it is possible. Uh, I am a optimist at the end of the day. Uh, I think there are, there are more incentives for it not to happen than for it to happen. But I do think that with people knowing more about artificial intelligence and using it more, like what's happening right now, the proliferation of LLMs, large language models, I think that it will happen. It's inevitable. So I want to shift gear a bit to talk about digital economy and remote work. This is, of course, you know, part of the thinking of the UAE, always about framing how do we ensure what's best there for our people, our residents, but also setting best practice that others then pick up. So when we, you know, we often think about the importance of building a culture in, in a work environment and so forth, but the reality is remote work is now here to stay in a large part. How do you see it from kind of your vantage point of the workforce, the labor force in a digital economy 
and with remote work almost becoming um, an entitlement that most workers or employees don't want to give up. How do you balance that while maintaining a culture of a place? So I am uh, conscious that Elon Musk is uh, currently uh, deploying a war against remote work and um, anything I, I say will be seen as me opposing his point of view. I specifically uh, didn't mention him, but thank you. That's what I was no, thinking. Uh, look, I know the trap when I see it. I know exactly why you're telling me to fall into this trap. Uh, it's going to make a great social media post. UAE minister says Elon Musk, da, da, da. But uh, look, the reality of the matter is this. Remote work has been with us for a while. Um, it's been with us across certain sectors. So for example, if you look at journalists, across the world, they don't necessarily need to work in an office. What matters is the output and the, the quality of what they come up with and how it translates to certain metrics, whether it's clicks, you know, reader base or influence or whatever it is. Uh, coders, if we look at the software side uh, of the world, coders were working remotely you know, for many years now. Okay, right. some, some coders had to be coming to the office, but, but most cases, there were coders that were working remotely. And then finally, when we look at these freelance platforms, there are people who choose for this to be their line of work. They do not want to have a job where they come to the office. They want to make sure that they have the flexibility. They can choose to get $800 a day or they can choose to get $8 a day. It's up to them. And their creativity is actually uh, magnified when they're on their own rather than when they're right. in groups. So uh, I actually do not think that it is an ultimatum whether remote work is going to be here or it's going to disappear. I think that it depends on the individual and it depends on the type of work. For what Elon Musk was saying, I actually agree with him. If you're going to build a company like Tesla and your job is to actually produce cars and to check on quality control and all of that, it makes absolutely no sense for you to work remotely. And, and I don't think that it is wise for it to be an option. If you think of a company like SpaceX, you know, it, one rocket exploding is more than $100 million you know, disappearing. And the, the actual payload itself is very expensive. So it requires people to be on the ground because what they're going to notice from the work that they're doing is going to be important for them moving forward. When it comes to something like Twitter, and I think Twitter can be done remotely at this phase that he's in right now. It's about bootstrapping, fixing, you know, uh, getting the company to a certain level where it's profitable, or at least not cash burning the way that it is. It makes sense as well for him to say what he's saying. So, so I actually agree with his direction. I think uh, what the UAE is aspiring to do is two things. The UAE is currently the digital economy leader in the region uh, by far. And uh, this is based on any metric that you guys want to see, whether it's um, uh, you know, foreign direct investment in, in, in the shape of venture capital into our digital economy companies, number of unicorns, quality of talent, number of talent, number of companies, all of that. Number of users to the platforms. So most UAE-based digital economy companies do not focus on a local market. The local market is a you know, cherry on top of, of the cake. What they actually focus on is a global market. So we always have global aspirations, and that's why you have companies that are always bigger in size than companies that are based elsewhere, right? And you have success stories like Kareem and, and you know, some others. So on the digital economy landscape, we are trying to emphasize and, and push forward the, the, the digital economy in the UAE and make sure that we are not local players, we are global players. We are becoming that. I think I can't take any credit whatsoever for this. This has happened from the days of Rahayn Sheikh Alubna and the first days of the Internet City and you know, the efforts that were put there by, by let's say, the, the generation that put the foundations. So what Steve Jobs said was, he can't take credit for anything because it wasn't really him. It was the people who put the sediments. And he had a solid ground. I think that's what happened. His Highness Sheikh Khalifa, uh, God rest his soul. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. Um, his Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. The efforts that were put for 20 years led us to being a leader in the digital economy. So, so my job is to maintain and sustain and grow. When it comes to remote work, we also believe that if there are people who are productive, who are creative, who can generate, let's say, outputs that are uh, at a higher level than those who could go to the office, digital nomads, we want them to choose the UAE first. And in most cases, these people will actually create digital economy companies or digital economy businesses um, once they choose a place. And we can see that from the, the Golden Visa program. So one thing that's not on my CV is I actually lead the uh, Golden Visa uh, program for the UAE federal government. And I see the numbers. 
the numbers show us that the UAE today is the most appealing country in the world for high net worth individuals and high quality talent. It's a fact. And that's made possible because of digital economies rising and having the infrastructure that's there. But what do you think could be on the horizon that could be challenging to maintain this momentum? I mean, that must be part of your job also to uh, mitigate risk. So in all transparency, um, uh, again, I, I do believe that we are blessed, but turmoil elsewhere does affect us positively because people do come here and they see stability, they see clear vision, they see continuity. So, you know, the direction is one. I think people are moving towards that direction. And, and leadership always emphasizes we want best quality of life. We want the best opportunities for the people. We want to ensure that the ecosystem is the most business friendly. We want to uh, you know, not even think about red tape. We want to always have red carpets everywhere um, for talent and for the business community. So uh, I think that's the first fact. But the second thing is you can't actually live your life hoping for turmoil to continue because I think you know, these things are cycles. We've matured as a society. If you look at what has happened over the last 50 years, uh, you know, 50 years ago with the founding fathers, with the late Sheikh Zayed, God rest his soul, when he came in and put the visions of this country, it was an aspiration. And there were a lot of naysayers, I am sure. Like, we are now looking at it in hindsight. You know, hindsight is 2020. We're saying, oh, you know, it was successful. It was very difficult. And it was an inspiration that he put forward, and people did not really believe that a country in the Middle East can achieve this. 50 years down the line, today, that aspiration became a reality. So what has happened is, you, today, when the president says something, when, when a minister says something, when the government says something, people take it seriously. Because these guys have proven over the last 50 years that they can deliver. They say something and they deliver on it. So I think the challenges are a lot smaller if you compare it to what they had to deal with, the, the founding fathers and the generation before us had to deal with. The challenges are smaller today, but the challenges are different. Today we have first world problems. First of all, like in the past our problems were how do you get electricity to everyone? How to pave roads? How do we ensure that we have a system to save our people? Like there are so many fundamental issues. Today, the problem is, how do I keep talent, like high quality talent, to grow roots here? Then you announce something like the Golden Visa Program, the Nationalization Program. The, the other question is, you know, how do we try to have the, the, the most positive climate? And whether it's a soft climate or actual climate, right, with cloud seeding and, and everything that's happening there. So we're actually focusing on moving from 99 to 100. So I think the efforts over the last 50 years were from zero to 99. But you have to put in the same effort to go from 99 to 100. You know, it doesn't get easier. Uh, you require a lot of effort, but the type of problems that you deal with are different. Complex problems in a complex world. I like that. Red carpet instead of red tape. I think that's, that's a great trademark. We're going to um, trademark you with it. But I wanted to, in our final minute before we wrap up, talk about the power of networks and connectivity. You have an incredible network of people who uh, call you a friend, but also someone they can rely on. We're connected through the network of the young global leaders, and there's, there's so many people here actually from the network of the young global leaders, and that's also one of those things that brings people together. So, but we're also overwhelmed with our connections, whether it's through WhatsApp or the travel time it takes to maintain those connections. So what's your golden rule to maintain those connections, those friendships, but also that trust? Um, okay, that's a big one to talk. Uh, I have to tell you, His Excellency said, I don't want to know any of the questions or any of the topics in advance. So he hasn't been prepped for any of this. He's, you're the only person I've had that joy with. <laughs> Well, in the era of chat GPT, people can just, you know, put the questions and get the answers. From. So I, I like to, to make it spontaneous. It's like a duel, you know, like uh, we have this conversation. So uh, I'll share a personal story first and then, and then maybe answer the question. Uh, uh, so early on in my career, and, and you know, credit where credit is due, um, there's a minister in the cabinet, his name is Mohammed Gargawi. He is, um, he was at a certain point and still is a mentor and, and you know, a dear um, friend and colleague. And I used to be uh, an ignorant young man. 
with, with some level of confidence that might have been seen as arrogance at that point of time. And I remember um, I was with him on an airplane. We were going to a business meeting, and I was a very junior employee. And he asked me, he said, um, Umar, what do you want to be um, you know, later on in life? I said, I want to be the richest man in the world. And he laughed, as you would if um, anyone says this to you. And he said, why do you want to be the richest man in the world? And I said, Your Excellency, so I can help people with my money. He said, why do you need money to help people? And it, it confused me at the time. I said, because I don't need to ask people to give me money to help people. Like, I can do it myself. And he asked me a question. He said, Umar, what's more important, money, knowledge, or network? And I said, I think it's money. And he said, you can have all the money in the world. If you don't have knowledge, you're going to lose that money. I said, OK, so knowledge. He said, you can have all the knowledge in the world. If you don't have money or you don't have a network, you can't really do anything with it. You'll be dependent on your fortune. I said, OK, so what's the answer? And he said, the answer is network. And he said, if you have the best network, you'll be able to access money and you'll be able to access knowledge, and you'll be able to create change across the spectrum, wherever you want to have change. And that really changed not just the way I see life, but it really changed me as an individual. It touched me as a very deep part of, of my being. And I said to myself, I need to be a person that has a network. And I then dug deep to actually understand what it means to have a network. And I think you can't be close to a million people. It's impossible. But if you do one good thing to a million people, they will all go, all go out of their way to serve you in any way they can. And I think to have the right network is first to be approachable, second is to be genuine. If you can't do something, say I can't do it. If you don't want to do something, say you don't want to do it. But, but the, the genuine part is very important. And third is always be ready to help. Um, and if you do that, Suddenly, I think it's like a snowball, right? Like one person introduces you to another person, tells you about a third person, and that network grows. Uh, honestly speaking, I don't think that I'm a great networker. There are people that are much better than I am. But uh, I am blessed that I have a network I can depend on. I think that's what matters. Thank you very much. Those are great words of wisdom. I'm afraid our time has run out. I'd like to thank you for your frank uh, responses and for um, being with us here today. Please uh, thank, you. thank our panelists.